When I was a kid, I was a very, very big fan of The Who, and I was a member of the fan club, and we used to get a newsletter, and throughout the 80s, it said that Roger Daltrey's big project was going to be a film about the craze, and that Roger Daltrey had bought the rights to the craze life story, and he was going to make this film, produce it. He was going to star as both craze. So how did we get... I mean, I think with hindsight, no disrespect to Roger, but I'm relieved that we've got the film we have and not that version. But how did that happen? How did Roger Daltrey, having a life story and making this thing, how did that become your craze? But it, it started with, with Gary and Martin and uh, <clears throat> the rock video company, isn't it? I mean, I wasn't, I was in America at the time, <clears throat> and, and Philip was working for that company, and they had trouble getting a good script written, isn't it? Yeah, but, you know, um, when we were in the band um, in the 80s, um, I think, you know, we all read Profession of Violence, and Steve Dagger, who managed Spandau, sort of set up this rumour that we were going to play the craze. And um, it wasn't really true, but um, we then were working with Dominic Anciano, uh, who was producing uh, a lot of the videos that the band were doing. And, and he said, look, you know, we should really try and make this happen. So I think Dominic got into conversation, and Ray Burdis got into conversations with uh, Roger Daltrey mm. and his company. I remember sitting next to Roger, actually, and he, he, just after this, and he, was, he thought we'd all done a great job. But um, I, I think what we got was the blessing, or not I didn't, but we didn't, I mean, the blessing of the family, um, which sounds a little strange, but I think it's what the insurers really wanted. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was strange, nice, um, you know, and uh, I don't forget, we went to see Aunt May, Martin and I went actually to visit Aunt May, <clears throat> because Ray Burdis had to give her... Uh, a pound, so her name could officially be used in the film. And this was at the top of a block of flats in Bethnal Green. Uh, we arrived in, in a Porsche, followed by a police car immediately, who thought we were a pair of drug dealers. And then we came out with a bunch of flowers, and the police, and we, was, we got called over, and we said, look, we've come to see our mate. Oh, right, give her our love. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we went up there, and, uh, um, and um, anyway, the pound was, was offered, and uh, she... She threw up her skirt and went, put it in me knickers. <laughs> um, he didn't. But, uh, <laughs> but then as we stood up to leave, and at that point, it was a year before we were going to shoot the film, and I'm a stone lighter, I've got longish hair, I've got an earring in, and as we stood up, Charlie Cray went, oh my God, he goes, for a minute I thought it was my own two brothers standing there. <laughs> so Ray said, don't worry, Charlie, you're going to get your money. <laughs> I'll tell you something else about Aunt May as well, and that... that that evening we went to see her. Uh, she brought out these the, the family albums, remember? And uh, she, she opened the pages, and the, each picture of different people in there, there were certain people cut out, that sort of were just like <laughs> nothing. <laughs> you know, like those little snowflakes you made when you were a kid. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we said, well, what, what's that about? You know. She, so she said, they're all the ones that turn the evidence. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, I don't know how to follow that as in terms of questions. <laughs> um, I mean, Gary and Martin, I mean, you, you grew up in, in Islington, which is obviously you're just the other side of Shoreditch from, from where the craze were, but presumably growing up in the 60s as London boys, I mean, they were around at that time. So, I mean, were you aware of them? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. My, my, uh, our cousin married uh, into the Nashes, which were the big Islington family. And, uh, and so um, they, they had a deal with the craze. So we sort of, yeah, we did know about them, of course, yeah. Legend at that time. But Philip, obviously, I mean, you grew up in Bethnal Green, so mm. I mean, that really is, that's the hub of the whole thing. And it must have been, at that, at that point in East London, I mean, there must have been, even more so than, than over in Islington, there must have been this sense that the craze were very much like the fabric of where you were. Well, I, I grew up, you know, this is the cliche to say now, isn't it? But of course, I grew up listening to my aunts and my mum and my grandmother talk about stories about the craze because I, I was in Bethnal Green, I was born in Old Bethnal Green Road, which is a stone's throw from Valence Road where the craze were born. And they were something kind of really mythical and uh, different even then. You know, it's kind of, I remember hiding um, underneath the table one night when my mum and my grandmother and two of my aunts were talking about how something that had just happened, it had just happened earlier that evening, that the craze had apparently um, attacked somebody down Hackney Road, left him in the middle of the road, and then driven backwards and forwards over the body 
until it was dead. He was dead, and of course, you know, absolutely thrilling stuff to listen to. You know, wonderful stuff for a seven-year-old boy. <laughs> <laughs> so, inspired me for the rest of my career. <laughs> um, but so you, so I grew up with that. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, in my experience, most people from Bethnal Green have a story about some kind of encounter with Ron. I mean, have you ever been around the craziest road? I mean, because and stories would kind of almost mythical stories, you know, where, where kids aren't even sure that you know they really met Reg and Ron, like Santa Claus. Well, 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 yes, it, it used to be that you know you couldn't go anywhere in East London without somebody who knew the craze. You know, now you can't go anywhere in East London without somebody who knows somebody who's been in a craze film. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, I, I, I kind of quite, I, I mean, I've always quite liked that kind of um, uh, the, the truth of the unreal, really, um, because I don't think it matters whether they knew them, whether they really knew the craze or they didn't. As long as they felt they did, that's just as true as if they did. And, you, you know, I mean, for example, just, I mean, the key line in the film for me is um, England is a dream which is what the American says when he comes over, mm. England is a dream. And so all of that is just a dream, really. <laughs> but whether you do something or you don't do something is irrelevant, so long as you believe you did it. Am I right in thinking at the time that you wrote the script, that you were, I mean, you were a painter by training? I still am, darling. I'm OK. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I, mean, I wasn't in the past tense. I haven't but... stopped anything. Um, <laughs> Well, well, I, I was only, I mean, I, I, I've been trying to work out the dates on this, and of course it all kind of blurs, but I wasn't, at the time I first met everyone, I wasn't that long out of St. Martin's School of Art. Oh. I mean, I kind of, I left round about the mid-1980s, and then um, all of this sort of like seemed to kick off, sort of 86, 87, round about there, so I wasn't, I wasn't that long out, so... Uh, yes, I, 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 I was doing painting, but I had a kind of um, like aeroplanes waiting to land at an airport. I had a kind of a few things that were wait that I'd written that were all waiting to be published. I had my first two novels, and I had a collection of short stories, and I had two children's books. And it's obituary, and, and yeah, of yeah, course, of course, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I've just written another one while I've been sitting here. <laughs> So they, they, they were all waiting to happen. So it was a kind of really strange time. Peter, tell me where you come into this, this narrative. Well, so you've got, you've got a pair of musicians in, in the role. I come from a completely different way because I come from Hungary, which was miles away from all this, you know. But I really met the craze, you know, in 1962 on a film when I was an assistant director of John Littlewoods called Sparrows Can't Sing. And on the first day of shooting, they turned up in their black cars. And uh, they got out of the cars and they said, but who is in charge? What, what's happening here? And uh, they said, who's in charge? They pointed at me and I was the assistant, the first assistant, you know. <laughs> so they came, I don't know if you ever told you this story, and they came up to me and, and they said, well, what's going on here? I said, well, we're making a movie. Uh, and they said, well, we, we, we haven't got any permission. I said, yeah, we got permission from the police, you know. But you can, uh, so I think it was Red Ronnie, you said, we could get into terrible trouble. Uh, I said, but from, with who? I said, with us. He said, you could get killed, you know, <laughs> because you haven't come to us, you know. Now, Joan Littlewood was a friend of theirs, you know, because her theater was in the middle of the terrain, you know. But she loved kind of putting on everybody. So she knew what was going on, and they said, you got to come down tonight to our club which was the Kentucky Club on Commercial Road. And I said to Joan, I said, you better come with me. I'm not going there alone. <laughs> but I mean, at that time, I, I saw that they were club owners, you know, they're tough guys, they're very good looking guys, particularly Reggie, you know. And uh, so we went there and, and basically the people... Uh, <laughs> we're going we're to still move on yeah, swiftly. I know. <laughs> Poor Gary, you know. Story my life. But anyhow. Uh, <laughs> We went there and they basically put the protection record on us on that film and we had two of the guys all the time and I think it was £2,000 a week. And so that's how I met them. And then I've become quite friendly with them because they kept calling up and come Pete, Pete, you better come down here. We've got a wrestling, charity wrestling match. So I go down to the East End and they're in town hall, everything is set up and everybody's there from the chief of police to the priest who married 
him, you know, who buried them and all that. And it was it's quite an incredible scene. And uh, quite a lot of it took place at the Iron Bridge pub. And the headquarters was uh, the Kentucky Club on Commercial Road. And uh, I've seen some things happening there at that time already, which was absolutely horrific, you know. So when Philip's script, out of the blue, arrived to me in Los Angeles, and I read it, I saw that his script was absolutely incredible. I didn't want to, I said, I don't want to know, it's all be the break bottle, I mean, break the beer bottle and smash it in your face, and all that old kitchen type, type sink movies, which we all seen in the early 60s here. So I didn't want to know until he read his script, and I thought it was absolutely brilliant because it was from the women's point of view, which was so important. <laughs> and it, it, no, it wasn't dead on, it was just two steps off. And uh, you witnessed their whole career throughout the, the script. And um, I thought it, it was incredible. And um, I arrived to London, you know, I had this meeting, and uh, Dominic and, and, and Ray said, uh, I think you were there already, and it's about the boys will be here in a minute because they haven't told me that the two of you were already cast since day one. Uh -huh. you know? <laughs> and he said, uh, Otherwise, me, well, no who chance. are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Otherwise, I, it would have been off. I know. <laughs> but that, that's when we first met, and we, we had this. I never forget it, you know. You were sitting there, you were sitting there, I was here, at, you know. Dominic was over there, and, and, um, and that's how we met. And uh, it was very obvious to me that they would be wonderful very quickly in the film. But I wasn't 100% sure until I started testing your wife-to-be's, all of them, <laughs> you know, and then the boyfriends. And then I kept reading the other actors for your various other sides, you know, but I was yeah. deeply kind of looking into both of you's heart. Can they, can they really do it, you know? And it was really obvious that it was going to be great, you know. Mm. And we had an amazing time doing it. And, and um, I mean, they beat the hell out of each other while they were rehearsing those boxing scenes. For how many weeks were you doing it, you know? Yeah, a um, few, few months actually doing yeah. boxing training. Yeah. I mean, I went to see them. It was petrifying. They were really beating the shit out of each other, <laughs> you know? How, how satisfying was that? <laughs> No, well, I think boxing, my brother hated it. I the boxing, I hated it. Hated it. Hated being attacked, uh, especially by my brother. And the trouble was that, you know, we used to fight and then the bell used to go. We just used to carry on. You know, we, there was lots of old scores to settle and it just went on and on. And, and I used to look into the outside of the ring for some kind of support, someone to break it up. And they're all going, oh, just leave them. I'm going, oh, yeah, no. really? <laughs> It's hard work. Kate, okay, I wanted to ask you, because one of the first things that, that strikes anyone about this film is the fact that it's, you know, you, you go into a film about the craze and you expect there to, to women to be on the margins. And in fact, one of the most unique yeah. and, and resonant things about the movie, I think, is that the women are at the centre. So tell me a little bit about your feelings when you first read this script and you thought, well, actually, maybe this is something, as an actress, maybe there's something very kind of important that I can do here. Yeah, I think, I, I, can't, I can't, I was 22, I guess, and mm. um, I've done the maths throughout the film and <laughs> I think I was 22 and then I, I think yeah 21 that's right and at the time I am um, I don't know if I realized what a brilliant script it was for women I think I was young I'd started in my career I'd done Mona Lisa with Neil Jordan that had quite a lot of women in it I was like I kind of had this naive feeling that that's what being in films was going to be like. Of course we're going to be in the fucking films. We're great. It's going to be about women. And I hadn't read loads of scripts, you know. Not I had done quite a lot by the time I did this, but I, you know, I'd read Philip's script and I was like, yeah, it's a brilliant script. I want to do it. It's actually watching it tonight <laughs> that I really am like, oh my God, I don't know. Actually, I do know. I don't think this film would be made now. Yeah. I don't know about the new mm. craze film coming out, but I doubt very much it's from the women's perspective as much as it is. I doubt very much that development people would allow something to be both action and so poetic and so female. Mm. And so it's actually now, which really depresses me, I've got to say, mm. 25 years later that I'm like, shit, this script was really amazing for women. At the time I took that for granted, now, I think most actresses would be beating each other up to get a part in this, you know, mm. because that most women now 
would be standing on the sidelines with the odd line and it would be all about the blokes. Mm. So I knew it was brilliant I, and I sort of fell in love with Philip's writing and mm. just thought, my God, this is like poetry. And I knew that was different. Um, but I, I really think it's now that I look back and think, whoa, okay. Did yeah. you get involved with kind of researching Francis? Because certainly at that mm. point, Francis was very much, I mean, there wasn't a lot known she about her. She was really one of the hard remarkable to research. The she was really hard to research. Charlie, Charlie Cray, the brother, was our advisor. And I felt um, like we would sit, I remember meetings in the production office, and mm. we would sit and everyone would say, and he wore this, and he had a snake, and he wore those shoes, and they went here, and they did that for hours. And I'd be going, can someone please tell me something about this woman? And they wouldn't tell you anything. They would go, oh, she was a bit funny. That was it. Mm. And there was, there's a really famous David Bailey photograph, which is kind of yeah. what we based those photos on when she is out. And that was sort of all I had to go on, is that she had this sort of look in her face mm. whilst they're all, and she, and so, mm. whereas everybody was, I felt at the time, everybody was full up with research. And actually, maybe I was really lucky there, that I, I, I could only go on Philip's script, really. I knew she killed herself. Yeah. And, but people wouldn't talk about it. Mm. And I, I remember at the premiere, and hopefully the people are dead now because I really <laughs> scared me at the premiere. <laughs> but I remember <laughs> being people being cross with me at the premiere that she had been portrayed in this way as if it was his fault. And I got some quite tight handshakes, you know, <laughs> yeah, that went on and for you, quite a long time. That, yeah, when okay. I was like, sorry, it, I'm sure she was mental. It wasn't all his fault. But <laughs> I went with what Philip was saying sure. yeah. and afterwards realised that that was quite taboo to sort of talk about what she had gone through. I mean, what, what Kate says is, is right. You know, forget all the research. In the end, we are the characters that Philip mm. made. Sure. And they prob you know, and I know that Philip didn't do the research because he wasn't bothered about it. Lord, well, you know, um, he was just basing was gonna, it on what he, what he already felt. I was going to ask, is setting the record straight? I mean, the story that's out there is that Philip didn't do any research at all. And <laughs> there, there are moments in the film which are kind of pretty much fiction, wonderful, glorious moments, which are fiction, particularly the, the, the childhood scenes. But actually, I mean, you, you, you boys did do some research. No, we did. You went to see You went to see Ron? Yeah, we did. I mean, just, just finishing off on that, you know, I think what, what makes the film very um, special uh, is, you know, it was coming on the backs of, of, a fi of films like Long Good Friday, you sure. know, and for really sort of realist, gritty, dirty... And uh, blokes. ...blokey things. <laughs> and, and Philip, and what well, you can see it tonight, I mean, it's a very heightened reality within the mm. film. It's mm. quite theatrical. There's a sort of Pinteresque, mm. sort of mm. Joseph Losey mm. kind of quality mm. about, and mm. I think that comes from Peter as well, because mm. his kind of education in film came at, out of British of movies in the 60s, you know. Sure, and, and, 50s, you know, six, God, there's a Zoom in there, you know. Yeah. And, um, I know, but the, the Zoom started driving you even me and say <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and I think I know, that uh, you know once we'd given up to that and accepted that and yeah. we're, you know the very stylized dances that when they leave the yeah. house and they go to, to, to the pub you know that beautiful choreography yeah. um, there isn't realism there but there's a great but it, it, it was know. an incredible period you know and I, I came here in 1956 you know and I caught that word and I'm so glad that I got here at the end of good old England, you know, I know it was after the war, very few, only a few years after the war, but the change of England, which then happened in the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s. But a, a lot, you know, I, I just carried my memory of what I found in the East End when I went there on, I hate to go on about sparrows can't sing, but that was my roadmap into this movie. And a lot of the actors in the film were all in that old movie. It's a great film. Murray Melvin and mm. all, all those Griff Davies. And because I wanted to bring the flavor of the East End in mm. through the casting of the older characters, you mm. know, Victor Spinetti. And mm. it's, they're just wonderful. And it was a whole tradition of a certain type of acting. And uh, it, uh, that's why I think the film has such a realistic value. <laughs> And at the time, we, or the film, was accused in America, which is the most violent country on the world, you know, that this film is so violent. And I said, it's got one ounce of that compared to any American movie. But the difference was that the characters were so real, so the violence is real. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the sword going through the, 
but in the, in the billiard hall and all that, and then uh, it was very important to so, and it was great the mixture of all of us of his writing and me, kind of foreigners coming in, but really having a crystal clear view of England and the East End of that period, and uh, I mean I, I knew them, you know, because. Uh, it was impossible to avoid them. And they liked me very much, so they kept calling up through various people, come again, come to this, come to that. And Well, that's one of the reasons I, I mentioned research, because actually, I mean, you've touched on it, Peter, and also Kate, you as well. I mean, you, you were working, it's not like the new film, because you were working at a time where both the twins were, were both alive, the family was still, you know, very kind of visible in the East End. Mm -hmm. And you must have been aware at that point, I mean, all four of you, that there was, or maybe not, but some kind of, special responsibility on your shoulders and that you know if you got this wrong or that you were seen to get this wrong that you know um, it, a dim view uh, uh, might be taken in slightly uncomfortable mm. quarters no I mean the, the, <laughs> thing, the thing were, that we always tried was uh, it was never meant to be an impersonation of the characters mm. it was just meant to be a feeling you know an atmosphere and I think that's what we, we captured uh, I don't think uh, any actor that goes out to play specific characters, if you try and impersonate, then uh, sure. it's never a good idea, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you're right, you know, there was a lot of background material for us at the time because everyone was still around. Um, it, the, the, what was really strange, though, meeting that whole family was, was so much like going to visit my own aunts and uncles. You know, they lived in the same type of houses. They, they uh, had the same kind of grouping. You know, the uh, aunts and uncles living in the same building, and uh, it was very strange, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, listen. Uh, the strangest thing was definitely going to Broadmoor to meet Ronnie. That was, um, uh, and um, Ronnie had it really easy because he got a visitor. He, you could go and visit Ronnie anytime because he was in a psychiatric prison. Yeah. So he had, he could wear his own clothes, he had TV. Um, he had a, a silk sky blue suit on when we went to visit him. And uh, he, he had these cufflinks with diamond encrusted R's. That shirt that we wear in the film, we, we, we copied that because he had it on in prison. And um, he said, you're not gonna play me with that earring in, are you? No, no, I'm not. No. And um, I mean, he was, if I, he was, I, I suppose meeting him, you re the only thing that I took from that was the way he s stared into your eyes rather strangely and, you know, never looked away, you know, so you had to do it with him. But um, <laughs> to, to be honest, Martin's right, you know, it, we couldn't impersonate. I mean, Ronnie had a really high camp voice. I, mean, I wasn't going to go that way. I mean, I would have been killed. But, um, <laughs> but at the end of it, we, we had this, we, he, we, at the end of it, uh, he goes, he goes, I'm getting a bit dehydrated now. He goes, it's the medicine they give me. And he goes off and, uh, and the, the, the in, inmate, the intern, who had been serving us, came up with a bill and, and he, he, it, 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 um, it was for a hundred pounds. And, uh, and I said, well, we only had two non-alcoholic lagers. He said, I hope you don't mind, but Ronnie put a few fags on there. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't mind. Yeah, you're not going to complain at that point, are you? I mean, I think, I'm glad you cut to the chase there, because what I was really trying to find out was how close any of you came to being killed. So I'm glad we just <laughs> it. Yeah, it, was, it was none of you, it was all fun. But, yeah, but you know, for me, in going in there to that whole trip to, in Broadmoor and meeting Ronnie and capturing that atmosphere, it kind of, it made me decide that I didn't want to meet Reggie. Because Same. you... you it's, it's, it's what I go back to saying, you know, it's not an impersonation. Mm. Once you've seen it and you've, got, yeah. you've had that feeling from yeah. Ronnie, you've captured that atmosphere, and that kind of is inside you, and that's what you try yeah. and bring out. Yes, it's terribly important when you make a movie based on true people that you know everything about them and you are so familiar with their lives, and then you have the freedom to go anywhere after that as long as you bounce off from the truth. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, it was enough for me. I didn't want to go in and, and visit Reggie and Ronnie. Mm. You know, and I had a message from them after they did see the movie, and they said, oh, tell Pete, Pete, but it was all came through Charlie, the third brother, tell Pete that he only made one mistake, is a mum never swore. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it? Important detail. Yeah, I remember that. A mum, yeah. 
we've talked a little bit about putting the film into place and getting it made and how difficult that would be now. I mean, how difficult was it then? Because it seems to me that for lots of the reasons why The Craze is such an amazing film and stands up so well now, it was always going to be a tough sell for financiers and for funders. I mean, or is that true? I mean, was it something that just fell into place? Or was it a, was it, was it a tough job to actually just get it on the screen? Well, I think that's probably a question for the producers who... Who, who are not here. Who are still on the run. <laughs> 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 but I, was, I mean, I was kind of—I was looking, but he sort of ignored me while I was yeah. doing it. But I was looking at you, Philip. And you oh, kind of, you glanced away. Yeah. I, was, I, I was don't, trying. I, was, I don't usually miss something like that. I was, I was, trying, to make, I was trying to make eye contact, but you just—it wasn't happening at all. I mean, I think particularly because it all starts with the script, you know. And the script is, as we've talked about, the script is a magical script. But I, I can imagine financiers looking at it and thinking, well, none, neither of these guys are very sympathetic. They're not very. I mean, that's you know. To be honest, that's how the new craze film was being sold as kind of the sexy mm. craze. And this isn't the sexy craze, it's something much more interesting. Well, I think, I think it had more to do with the slow motion <laughs> it's true, swan at the beginning. beginning. <laughs> oh, no, 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 Gary, my apologies. <laughs> it, was, um, it, it was difficult. I mean, I wasn't part of all of that, but um, it was, it, it was the, the approach that I wanted to take on the script was a hard sell to everyone from the beginning because nobody, you know, it is before we went to finances. I mean, I've always said that the script got made as it eventually got made because it had the support of all the actors mm. in it, that the actors read it and Peter read it mm. and loved it. But it was a hard sell because everyone had in their mind what they thought a film about the craze should yeah. be, you know, which was kind of, you know, opening shot, someone's head gets blown off and there's a chase down Whitechapel Road and, you know, and, 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 and I had no interest in that really at all. So when I got... When it was suggested to me, um, did I want to have a, a bash, uh, what I would do with the script, I said to the producers, let me go away for a couple of weeks and I'll do a very rough draft of how I think the script should be. It, well, it's not the final script by any means, but it's a kind of how I think the script should be approached. And the key things that were in that script were the swan at the beginning. Um, the first chunk of childhood, the dominance of the female characters, and the rejigging of all the uh, factual events. I mean, lots of the, th some of the, th not lots of the things, but some of the things you see in the film did, in a way, actually happen, but True. not in that order. Mm. Sure. So they're all completely taken out of order. So I, it was like I had this jigsaw puzzle in front of me of all these events, and I moved them into an order that told um, a satisfying narrative. So the death of Francis was moved to be the trigger to the two murders at the end that I put on the same night, whereas in reality, the murder of Cornell and Jack Bahat, there's years between those two murders. So or, I, I, I used it in much the same way as you would kind of tell any stories. How can I tell the best story from these kind of little peaks of narrative event? And then I just put into it all the things that, uh, that you know, I've always written about really, which is strong female characters, dominating mothers, the East End. So, so I did all of that, and that was a hard sell right from the beginning because your people, as I said, had an idea of what they thought the film should be, and the first read of that was so against the script. But as I said, everyone, everyone who was acting in it, one by one, they all said, "No, this is the approach that we want to take." Yeah. And Martin and Gary, presumably, I mean, you were trying to keep the film alive at that point. I mean, when, when, the, when there were being question marks raised, I mean, because you two were on board already by that point, I'm assuming that you... And at that point... You know, you know we weren't producers, you know, we were... Mm. We, we, there was not a lot we could do, you know, we were just hoping that the film would be made, and that's why we ended up boxing training for so long, because it kept getting called off. Um, <laughs> but I think it was Peter's little address book, which is historic and amazing and <laughs> has every single person he's ever met and their phone and Peter's so good at calling you whenever he's in town and dialing and, uh, and we love him for that and I think he just called in all these great names and I think Billy Whitelaw was a really yeah. fantastic Easy name to get you know there. these are the you know that's what the financiers yeah. were, were liking mm, sure. about it probably and then it just took someone to say yeah look I'll take a chance on this and I don't mm. think they were you know so there was originally not a big budget I remember Billy got very sick Oh at the beginning God, yeah. of the film, mm. really yeah. sick, and there was a lot of days oh, yeah. called off, yeah. and a seven-week shoot turned well. into an eight-week shoot, yeah. which I think was, you know, to Peter's it advantage. It was a miracle, yeah, an absolute miracle. I mean, what happened with Billy is that she hadn't 
worked on a film for a long time, and she got incredibly nervous, which she covered up very well. She got a rash. Yeah, but you remember? She, she yeah, nervous. she broke out in a whole rash, and then the doctors came and said, got to go to the hospital immediately and all that. And we basically lost her for, I think, for, for two weeks. Mm. But her role but is, is, is also, you know, I mean, that's, that shows you what we were talking about earlier about the kind of film it is. Because, mm. you know, she's the most famous actress of Beckett. Yeah. You know, so mm. her style sure. was, was not your regular cinema. Sure. It's not what a Reality. financier would go no, for either. No, we must no, have no. that Beckett no, actress no. in our film. Yeah, Beckett. Yeah. Oh. That'll oh. bring him in. But where, yeah. did that, <laughs> where, where did that idea come from? Because it seems like such one of those casting masterstrokes. And you watch the film now and you think, well, of course it's Billy Whitelaw. Yeah. How could it ever have been anyone else? But yes, yeah, I'm yeah. sure at the time. Who's no, Billy but Whitelaw? I, I thought she would be brilliant in it, you know. So I kept at it and had wonderful casting directors. And, but I must say, which doesn't happen anymore in the film business, Basically, you know, I had, once I took, and I love Philip's script, you know, but I'm like an idiot, when I turned, got off the plane, because I read, when I knew the craze, there's so much more to the story. And you remember we had a meeting very early on, I said, Philip, oh, I want you to change this scene and that scene, because what about that, we have to put that in here and all that. He looked incredibly blank at me, but I realized very quickly, you know, that if I, insert any more stuff, I will destroy the entire structure of the script. And I, I, I just took his script and made the whole film like that, but we were very fortunate that the producers were basically protecting us, you mm. know. And I had complete, nobody came up to me, why are you doing this shot? Why are you doing, why I keep doing these zooms? Well, I'm the zooms I did because we couldn't afford I couldn't get closer into his eye, otherwise, he, you know, unless I had the zoom. So I, I chose, I'm just going to do it. I know everybody hates zooms. I do too, you know. I and love them. Huh? I love a zoom. Yeah. Especially but, a crash zoom. Yeah, but that's something else, you know. But he gave but, it that 60s look. Yeah. I think. Yeah, but it's a 60s yeah. period movie, so that yeah. was the style of the film. But uh, they, they were incredible, and it was led by this incredible guy who's unfortunately, who's Jim Beach. Mm -hmm. And he, put the whole thing together. Mm. And I had this insane meeting after I met you guys. I had to go down to the city with Dominic and, 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 and Ray, and we had this insane lunch. And it was a, uh, the, 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 the boardroom office of a bad, bad, a bad, boring, a bad ball bearing, ball bearing <laughs> company. <laughs> See, it's 50 years of good and English. Bad boring. You know? <laughs> I can't say that. <laughs> but, you know, and I said, what the f am I, what are we doing here? I mean, who are these people, you know? And I, I realized, well, I mean, they put the money up. You know, that company put the, the ball money. Bearing the ball-bearing company. The ball-bearing wow. company. <laughs> I never knew. Who and ball-bearings yeah, no, through but the because they, Of course. <laughs> because they own this company called Parkfield Entertainment or whatever, you know. And they were on videotapes and selling movies and all that, making millions of dollars. And then about two years later, all the videotapes went back to them, and the company basically gone bankrupt, you know. But but not not the holding company, but they were the ones paying for it, you know. And that's what happened. That's yeah. It was a miracle. <laughs> and today it couldn't happen because you have to deal with the studios, and you have 89 million meetings with people who have nothing yeah. to do with it, who don't know anything, you know, but they will tell you everything of what you should do. I don't know if you can even get and ball that's bearings what, anymore. That's what, it's a miracle <laughs> that a movie gets made nowadays. What was the atmosphere like on set? Because it sounds like you were working more than anything. You were having to work hard. I mean, this was a film where there wasn't a huge amount of money being thrown around. But, I mean, was it a happy set? Yeah. yeah I, sorry, I yeah. have um, a photo album still of all the photos. Yeah. And the thing that always really makes me laugh, because I've just got photos of me and Martin, like, <laughs> 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 cracking up, laughing. Like, the scene when I, yeah. that he beats up the guys around the car... All the stills I've got at home, we are yeah. pissing ourselves. Yeah, and I think I like, Peter is yeah. just like a joyously relaxed. Mm -hmm. And Peter, Peter's a terrible person because he makes everyone think he loves them deeply. <laughs> and so you've got a set of people wandering around feeling like they're loved deeply from like. Well, you are. Yeah, <laughs> like, we love everybody. <laughs> but you know, you've got runners who are like, oh, Peter Medak was just so lovely to me. And you've got actors who are like, Peter Medak was so lovely to me. And I think you, that, that was very, um, as well as knowing you're working on a brilliant script, 
there was something incredibly just extraordinary about being on this set with someone who's like, I love you, I love this, that is brilliant, you're a f- yeah, I love this. And <laughs> no. It felt like that all the time to, yeah, to but me. Yeah, look, you know what, there had to be a lot of trust. We were doing a film about the craze, which is basically a film about women with two pop stars and a Hungarian director. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so we were just totally relaxed. You know. <laughs> At the end of the 80s, our career was over anyway. <laughs> but, but that I new think chapter I, was you know, up, you know, the wonderful thing is that I had not seen them as Spandau Ballet, right. ever. You didn't know right. who they were at all. No. Well, I knew who Spandau <laughs> Ballet was, but I haven't seen them. And when I met you, I thought, and I better look at that side of your whole life, you know. And it wasn't until last, uh, six months ago, that they came to Los Angeles. And, and the boss called up saying, you better come now, you know, because we're going to perform and we're starting a world tour. And I went to see them and I was blown away by them. But I kept saying, but they're not my boys, they're rock and rollers. You know, this doesn't make sense. It's not Reggie and Ronnie. <laughs> and it was an incredible experience to watch that, you know. But I mean, I think there's a mixture of all this coming left, right and center and being left free and to be able to mm. really have a wonderful time with each other. And, and to just create whatever we all thought was the best, you know, and then just shoot out of it, you know. <laughs> but but also, also, I have to say, you know, when we were on that set, I think we all knew how important the film was. Yeah. You know, we all knew that this was stuff of myth and legend, the craze, you know, how yeah. important it was to, to London, how important the story was to my mum my and dad and mm, my sure. aunts and uncles and people who lived in Islington where I grew up as a kid. And I think we all felt, uh, I mean, I did, and I, know we, Gary, I, sp- I spoke about it with Gary, a certain responsibility that we all had to those people when we were making that film. And I think for that reason, we all also we understood how lucky we were to be on that set because we all knew that it was an important movie. Yeah, yeah and there's great actors out there and everyone's fighting for jobs, so you mm. know, you're just happy when you're there. You know. I t- didn't feel responsible to the craze. Okay. I really didn't. No, no you know. to the story. Yes, maybe to the story, but for me, I, you know, I'm a good Hampstead bohemian girl and I didn't feel like, oh, East End history. My mum is here and she'll be squirming in her seat because my mum was born in the East End. But I have to tell you, mum, I was brought up in Hampstead and, and bohemian and <laughs> she won't let me say I'm middle class. I'm not allowed to say that, which I am. But <laughs> I didn't have that kind of mythology about the craze. I felt quite responsible for her and women who get quite bullied, but I didn't feel mm. like, oh, I love the East End, I love the craze, I hope we're doing them justice. Yeah. But that's yeah. what I'm pleased well, no, really we never <laughs> thought of that, you yeah. know, because we knew who they were. Yeah. But it was important to portray it 100% real and correct, yeah. of, to give an impression of what it was like then. Yeah. yeah. I think that's, that's why people like Jimmy Jewell, you know, doing yeah, that, yeah, yeah. I mean, it kills me with that little dance he does. The ball at the beginning and the, jack. Of the club, because it so brings good. that whole period of music hall, all that whole world and the acting and oh, it was magic. I mean, he was a million dollars worth of value, mm. darling Jimmy. Oh, you know. beautiful. But Martin, I mean, you mentioned you mentioned the importance of being this being a London film, and I mean, I think to be honest, we're here as part of the London on film season. And when you think about the craze, you do you, you line it up alongside the Longer mm. Friday, you line it up alongside performance. Yeah. I mean, and it's interesting chemistry here as well because you've got four Londoners and one one person who's coming through, and it's the director coming with yeah. the eyes from outside. I mean, do you think that was part of yeah. of the magic of the yeah. film is that there was this this non Londoner in yeah. the midst of it? But it's lots of time I didn't love everybody into saying because you know we are going to have to get everybody into the right place and the right way and the no, right scene. I, I think you're right though. I think, you know, Peter's view of London was a cinematic view, you know. He'd, he'd seen London on the screen mm, yeah. a lot and and then worked in, in London movies. So I think that, that was probably the objective side of, of, what he, of, of where he was coming from, yeah. made it work. Yeah. I mean, when did you all realise that you'd made something very special? I mean, was it, because obviously a film... Well, he was in Leicester Square place. for four weeks. That was right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that right. was good. Because yeah. sometimes that can take a long time. And I mean, the thing I wanted to ask you, actually, before I hand over to the audience, was at what stage you knew that the reputation of this film was growing and growing and growing? Because my memory is that the critical response was very positive and the film did well, but actually in the 25 years since, the reputation has only got bigger. And actually people do talk about the craze now as, as I say, a very substantial. It's, a, it's an important and great yeah. British and London film. It's cab drivers. Yeah. Is it? But yeah, for me, <laughs> no. it was just like yeah. for about 10 years and yeah. probably even now, 
it's cab drivers will always, the Absolutely. minute I get in, will go, you're in the craze. And I'm like, oh my God, mm. this, this film has been seen by like every oh, cab no. driver that has ever that's driven a, that's a, a very cab. important yeah. audience. Yeah. Yeah. It's an important they're all, demographic they're all, to reach. Uh, they're all driving for the craze, the fathers and everything. Yeah. Isn't it? Huh? The same, every time I come in from LA, London airport, you know, they start, everybody starts on you and they, they ask asking questions and, and then suddenly it comes out. Of the was, bag. It, was it me or you, Mark, who had the cab driver who said, you know how they got their superpowers? It was you, was it? Yeah, it's me, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he said to me yeah, one day, you're, you're, you're doing a film and you had a craze. I said, yeah, that's right. He said, you know how they got their superpowers, don't you? <laughs> I said, no, go on then. He said, their mum used to make them drink the water that the greens was cooked in. <laughs> <laughs> We were already doing drama with Anna Schur. Mm. So, you know, mm. we were, Anna Schur was really the Joan Little, the next generation's Joan Littlewood, yeah. really. Mm. She was giving access to working class kids to not just do drama, but to end up making films and doing theater. She only dealt in improvisation, mm. so it became a kind of therapy for us. And I, you know, I know as kids, we really developed as people going to Anna Schur in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, and, you know, I think what, before then, you know, the, you know, Joan was the only one who ever got work, real, genuine working class people up on stage, you know, without being comedians. And so um, it's really came from her, as, you know, my, my I, I wouldn't say my school had anything to do with, with um, yeah, me too, developing yeah. me too. my but instinct for drama. I would say that, uh, absolutely. I think Anne Sher not only gave us the, the skills that you, that you need to uh, to do that, but uh, also the skills that you need in life. You know, she, I, I would say she practically built my personality to some extent. Oh, from the script to hell of a lot. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's a kind of horror fairy tale, um, really. The, the, strangely enough, just touching on what you've just said there, the first thing that I said when the producer said to me, uh, do the screenplay, was I said, no police. Mm. We have got the most uncinematic police force <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in the world, yeah. you know? So I said, I just can't have a, pol a British police uniform. I just can't do it. No police. And, and also, I'm just not interested. Yeah. Not interested in the police investigation. You know, it's like people sitting around a table, you know, go, well, we've followed them down this road, sir. Oh, you yeah, I need some information about that. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, pretty damn quick. We've got to get that. Yeah, well, I tried, Governor. I tried. Right? I tried. You know, it's, oh, there's some really great images to be having, uh, having that, had in that room. So, so no police. But th there's... Um, They're going th from Dixon and Dog Green, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, well, exactly. It's just not... You can't... I, I don't know how it can work. It's just so uncinematic. I just can't bear it. So all of that went. And what I did was, as you said, it was concentrate on the periphery, mm. really. So they're all things that are kind of, you know, it's never explained in any great detail how their rise to fa uh, uh, um, uh, fame and criminality happens. All of that is what happens behind doors. You don't yeah. hear any of that. You just hear bits, the tangential bits. Sure. They're like all the bits that you would usually leave on the cutting room floor are the bits that are in the film, mm. yeah. in, narratively. You know, they're people making cups of tea, they're people sure. kind of, you know, there's, you know, but one of my favorite scenes is um, the, uh, um, the girlfriend who gets pushed out of the car for calling yeah, Jack the Hat yeah. bald. You know, I know exactly how he feels. <laughs> exactly. um, but you know, so, so, so they're all the kind of tangential little bits, but it does have kind of horror references. You know, I mean, I grew up with horror films. Um, so all of that language, I think, is sure. mm. is there. I mean, it's it's yeah. on the verge of Grand Guignol mm. at every point. And I think it really becomes Grand Guignol in the last ten minutes. Yeah. You know, it's all reds and blacks sure, and sure, deep sure. shadows and absolutely. And that's, all the, of that's that. the Billy Whitelaw thing as well, because actually, for a lot of people, obviously, many people will know from Beckett, but also for yeah. a lot of people, they'll have thought, oh, it's the Omen. The Omen, and that, absolutely, just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, the Omen. Yeah. The score is very horrible. Yeah, as well. it it's is. Totally. Yeah. Well, it's a kind of, it's a, a collaborative thing between sure. anyone once a film starts happening. I mean, I think there's certain things in the script 
that are described, if you read the script, there's certain things that are described, and then what Peter did was really run with that sure. re- and kind of really pursue with that. And everyone just... I mean, there's no other way... You, you know, I, I remember saying to um, the producers, apart from the big thing about no police, after I said that, <laughs> I said, we've got to put all our cards on the table within the first five seconds about what kind of film this is mm. because we can't fool anyone. Sure. So we've got to have an image that completely throws everyone into this world, um, throws them in the sense that they think, you know, the, the double meaning of that, first they think, oh, this is not the kind of film I thought I was going to see. I see a fl- slow motion flying swan and a woman's voice saying, shall I tell you my dream? That's the opening line of the film, shall I tell you my dream? So you have that kind of strange ambiguity of, is it a dream of that story? Is she dreaming the whole thing at the end? So you have that kind of thing. But we, we had to put all the aces on the table. You know, we yeah. had to say, look, you're going to see something um, that is not what you expected to see, and we're going to do it in this heightened, uh, hi- hyper-real, poetic way so that you don't, um, you don't fool anyone to think they're seeing something and then surprise. It's all there. Is that making this makes kind of, yeah, kind of sure. sense, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know, it, yeah, yeah. You, you, you're kind of declare. It's like an overture. I always saw that yeah, as an overture. Absolutely, but there's also there's a there's a wonderful symmetry in the whole movie, which is when I took Philip's script, you know, I completely embraced it and I twisted it out into visual terms, of right from the beginning with the two babies being born and and them playing in the street. So there's always parallels and very mm. symmetrical, you know which is one of my kind of madnesses, whatever subject it is. But it, 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 particularly for this, it really fitted it, you know, those double images at the mirror. And it mm. just does the whole thing because they were identical. And I completely believed of them being identical twins, you know, really. And it was their wonderful acting and also is the imagery of it, of how you create it and how you kind of manipulate the film and the audience with it. Right, to film films with, I think, the best kind of yeah. madness. It's still an extraordinary film. Um, we're going to have to leave it there, I'm afraid. But please join me in thanking for making this extraordinary movie. <laughs> Philip Ridley, Peter Medak, Martin and Gary Kemp, and Kate Hardy. <laughs> <laughs>